The Future of the Human Race with Stephanie Drimmer from National Geographic. Welcome back to the Cosmic Companion. This week we look at the future of the human race. We're going to be talking with Stephanie Drimmer from National Geographic. We'll be discussing how our species might change over the coming years as we get an inside look at her new book from National Geographic, Ultimate Book of the Future. Now, millions of years ago, a few foolhardy, uh, brave ancestors of the human race first dared to come down out of the trees. These daring primates faced unknown dangers as they scurried across the ancient savannas. Since our earliest days on the Serengeti Plain, the human race has been confined to the base of one lone planet. Meanwhile, there are likely more than 500 billion planets in the Milky Way alone, and hundreds of billions of trillions of planets scattered throughout the universe. For more than six decades, our species has been held hostage to the very real danger of nuclear annihilation. Today, our world also faces rising temperatures leading to an increase in storms, dis disrupting natural cycles of microclimates and biology. This in turn can drive extreme weather events leading to human migrations and armed conflict. On the 12th of April, 1961, Soviet Air Force pilot Yuri Gagarin became the first human being to move beyond the confines of our planetary birthplace. Since that time, more than 600 people have traveled to the final frontier. Sorry, Kirk. The International Space Station has been continually occupied by human beings from dozens of countries since November of 2020. Now, in the next couple decades, hundreds or thousands of humans may be living in space stations and habitats on the face of the moon and Mars. For the first time ever, our species will be provided a refuge in case of planet-wide disaster. At the same time, evidence may be found for life on another world. The laws of chemistry and physics, particularly the intricacies of water and carbon, make life among the stars a near certainty. The first signs of extraterrestrial life may have already been collected by the James Webb Space Telescope. Roughly 8% of observation time for Webb will be spent studying just one solar system, TRAPPIST-1. There, seven rocky planets huddle close to a small cool star. At least four of these planets may have climates suitable for liquid water on their surface. Now, by breaking light up into rainbows or spectra of light, astronomers are able to determine the chemical makeup of stars, nebulae, and the atmospheres of planets which just happen to pass in front of their parent stars seen from Earth. Now, high concentrations of certain molecules, notably oxygen and methane, are likely to be found on worlds teeming with life. Such a finding could reveal evidence for even the most primitive life forms on another world, similar to those microbes which populated Earth for more than two billion years before the first multicellular life. The first data being recorded right now by the James Webb Space Telescope are ideally suited to finding this evidence. However, there's always a however, if such alien atmospheric anomalies are found, the findings are gonna need to be confirmed time and again before any such pronouncement is made. Why? Hello there. Now, seeing chemical biomarkers in the atmospheres of other worlds will still be a far call from the certainty of a close encounter of the third kind, featuring a flying saucer landing in Times Square. But this first sign of extraterrestrial life will suggest to us that we are not alone in the universe, changing the human race forever. 
As we find life among the stars, we're also likely to find sentient beings of our own creation, artificial intelligence. Recently, an engineer at Google was relieved of duties for claiming artificial intelligence developed there, called Lambda, developed self-awareness. Such claims were refuted by the internet giant. Aside from whether or not Lambda in particular is sentient, we're certainly on the cusp of revolutionary advances in both computers and our relationships with technology. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth, and we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. Next up, we talk with Stephanie Drummer about her new work, Ultimate Book of the Future, from National Geographic. This week on The Cosmic Companion, we're delighted to be joined by science writer Stephanie Drimmer. She is just uh, put out Ultimate Book of the Future from National Geographic Kids. Fantastic work. And we're going to talk to her about her ideas of what the future might look like. Welcome to the show, Stephanie. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So first of all, what is it that inspired you to write this book? So the idea was, you know, let's not show kids what might happen 100 years or 200 years from now. Let's talk about what the world is really going to look like in maybe the 2050s when kids reading this are adults. So pretty much all of the tech in this book um, is really happening. It's got uh, prototypes, patents, teams working on it. Doesn't mean that everything is going to become part of all of our everyday lives. No, the future is hard to predict. But um, this is all really real stuff. It's not fiction. Hmm. Interesting. So what, you know, there's a lot out there and a lot of ground to cover, but what is it that excites you most about the near future? Um, that's a good question. I think, uh, I think that we're sort of at the cusp of a lot of big changes. You know, I mean, they say that technology increases exponentially. And I think that the most exciting thing about the future is really what we can't predict. I mean, when I was a kid, we never could have predicted the internet and how the internet would change our world. And mm -hmm. so it's pretty exciting to imagine what is gonna be the internet of the next generation, the things that we, we really can't predict at all. But in terms of the near future, um, one thing that's pretty exciting is flying cars. Um, mm -hmm. People have been talking about flying cars for a long time. And actually the first prototype for a flying car came out in 1911. Um, wow. So we've been, yeah. So we've been saying that uh, flying cars are just around the corner for over a century, and so far that's been a bust. But we really are now on the cusp of flying cars. There are a ton of companies with working prototypes who are shuttling people around, and companies working on the logistics side. You know, where are these flying cars going to take off from? Where are they going to land? Um, the idea is it'll probably first show up in sort of major mass transit short distance areas, like, for mm -hmm. example, from between Manhattan to JFK Airport. Um, I'm a former New Yorker. I can tell you that trip is an unpleasant hour in the subway and uh, <laughs> with flying cars. It's estimated to be about six minutes. That's pretty exciting. Wow. Wow. That's pretty incredible. And so um, I've heard that flying cars may actually be easier to develop than self-driving cars, just because there's a lot fewer obstacles. Yeah. You know, that you know, there sense. aren't a lot of sudden twists and turns and, you know, up in the sky. 
Totally. I th think uh, people are also thinking about combining the two technologies at some point that, you know, self-driving will apply to not just cars, but also flying ones. Hmm. So speaking of self-driving cars, and of course, it's going to apply to flying cars as well. Um, now, we have, you know, roughly in the United States, about 46,000 people a year are killed in automobile accidents. And 4.4 million are sent to the hospital. Uh, but there is such an outrage among many people when you know you have a single fatality say from from a self-driving car why is that is there a fear of technology if that drives that or and if so how do we get past it i think that's a really good question it's something that also baffles me especially when most or all of those accidents are user error. You know, you're not supposed to be just letting your Tesla drive you down the freeway while you take a nap. You're supposed to be paying attention. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I think that you're right that people have to, like, of course there are risks. There are risks to everything. Um, but you do have to compare uh, the, the safety of self-driving technology with human error. And, I mean, I think it's pretty obvious, like, the stats that you're saying, but... Um, that humans are a lot more prone to error when it comes to driving cars than robots are. So um, I personally would be totally comfortable with a uh, self-driving car or a plane or whatever kind of vehicle. Um, and uh, I mean, I think people are getting more accustomed to the idea and maybe it's just a matter of time. Hmm. So is there, are there any developments or possibilities of technologies uh, in the future that do frighten you or that you think have the great potential for doing evil to, <laughs> to anti-paraphrase yeah. Google's old motto? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think that technology is only as good as the person wielding it, right? And um, just because we're coming, we're becoming more powerful. Yeah, it means technology could be used for for powerful evil. Um, but I don't think that in and of itself, technology is is something to fear. It's not out to get us. Um, I don't really envision a future in which um, robots decide that we're bad for the planet and try to destroy us. Although, never say never. Um, but yeah, <laughs> I mean, I think that... dystopian option is possible. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering how it is that technology can advance education. Uh, what, what are the schools of the future going to look like? Ooh, that's a good question. And something I didn't get into specifically in the book, but I think, you know, one of the things we've seen uh, just since this book was, uh, since I wrote the book and the time that it was produced is uh, how world the world has changed through the pandemic and how all of us is, have become a lot more comfortable with um, telecommuting. And I think that that's just something that's going to continue to happen. Um, I also think uh, we've moved into this era when people look at the internet as um, not only just everywhere, but as something that's almost a human right, that um, people everywhere should be able to have access to this wealth of information and ability to communicate uh, with everyone. So there are some pretty cool companies, um, you know, there's Starlink, looking at uh, figuring out ways to bring internet to everyone around the world so that people, even in the most far-flung locations, are able to, to access it. Um, and that's something that I think just sort of changes, you know, talking about education, that's something that just enables our education as the human race as a whole to just move forward dramatically. Hmm. And so when we have, you know, there are a lot of possibilities, what could happen in the future? Um, but as how, when we look at ideas and opportunities uh, for, for the future, how do we use those ideas to inspire children into lives of science and technology? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think they're already doing it. There are a lot of inventions in this book are things that kids have come up with. Um, there's a really cool device that's uh, able to collect trash from the oceans that was invented by a kid. 
Um, and I think, you know, there's a lot of other technology centered around kind of saving the planet. Um, what can we do about trash in the oceans, about climate change, uh, about, um, you know, plastics piling up and, uh, a lot of people and, and kids too are working on, uh, technologies to be able to solve those problems. Um, you know, in addition to measures that we all need to take, uh, reducing waste and energy loss and all of that. So I think that, um, you know, uh, kids are some of the most inspired people when it comes to the future. Absolutely. Totally agree with you. So one of my favorite parts about your new book is future fails. <laughs> <laughs> Technology we might all be hoping for, but probably isn't going to happen. So what, what is your favorite future fail, Stephanie? Ooh, oh gosh, that was one of my favorite features to do in this book. You know, there's so much yeah. cool tech that we didn't anticipate, but then there are also these things that we thought we would have, and we totally don't. A lot of stuff from, you know, the Jetsons and Star Trek, uh, things like force fields and anti-gravity. Um, I, I really enjoyed writing those, those future fails. Um, one of them that is particularly cool, I think, is the uh, the force fields idea. So, you know, the idea mm -hmm. is you've got an enemy plane on your tail that's shooting at you, and good thing you're able to press this button and engage your handy <laughs> force field. Um, and uh, funnily enough, um, I believe it's Boeing has a patent filed for a force field, um, something that would detect um, an energy field coming and uh, put up sort of a plasma wall. Um, but it turns out that just because you have a patent for something doesn't mean that you know how to make it. Um, so there's just no way that, uh, I mean, the, there's no technology that exists to create this kind of plasma right. field. Right. And even if it did, it would only stop the energy um, of the explosion or whatever it is. And it wouldn't stop things like shrapnel. Um, coming through. So, you know, even if they could build it, not that effective of a force field. So that is one future fail. Hmm. Hmm. And um, so another bit I really liked about your, your book was jobs of tomorrow. So what do you think are some of the more surprising jobs of tomorrow that people might not have thought of? Yeah. I mean, I think this is exciting for kids because they're wondering what am I going to do when I grow up? And you may not be looking at the normal jobs that people have been looking at for so long, you know, doctor, lawyer, teacher, there's all kinds of new, um, there's new careers too, you know, drone operator, space pilot, um, undersea medical researcher is one of my favorite, you know, uh, there are a ton of uh, really cool drugs that have come from the ocean, you know, um, from plankton and interesting deep sea fish. And, you know, the ocean is still a, a hugely unexplored area. And so the hope is that, you know, along with the rainforest, that materials in the ocean or, or organisms in the ocean might be something that we can tap into to find new cures. And so it's very possible that uh, a kid now could have a future job diving down, finding new stuff, bringing it back to the lab and seeing if we can use any of it. So interesting. Finally, let's look into your own future. What's, what's next for Stephanie Germer? <laughs> um, well, I've always got a couple of books cooking. My next book uh, that is being worked on right now for Nat Geo is called, uh, so we're going away from the past and we're going all the way back in time to the dinosaur age. And um, this book is called How to Survive the Age of Dinosaurs. And the premise is, you know, let's say, you know, we all read about dinosaurs. Dinosaurs are super fun. Kids love dinosaurs. <laughs> dinosaurs but, are wonderful. <laughs> But what would happen if you were actually transported back to the time of dinosaurs? You know, could you even breathe the air? Could you eat the plants? What kinds of predators would be out to get you and how could you survive their attacks? So it's sort of a survival guide to one of the coolest time periods in Earth's history. That sounds so interesting. I'm looking forward to having you on this show to talk about that one when it comes out. I'd love that. Excellent. And that was Stephanie Drimmer author of Ultimate Guide, no, Ultimate Book of the Future from National Geographic Kids. Just came out.
check it out anywhere. Now, if our distant hominid ancestors had never ventured out from the safety of their homes in the trees, modern humans might never have evolved. We might still be sitting up somewhere in twisted branches, peering through folds within bark, looking for a delicious cricket snack. Crunchy on the outside, chewy on the inside. Uh, today, our species stands at an inflection point in our evolution similar to that faced by our hominid ancestors. A perfect storm of change is brewing. We are nearly certain to become a space-faring species at nearly the exact moment in time when we find life among the stars and our own creation, artificial intelligence, develops consciousness. Will we cower from the challenges, costs, and risks and slink back to rampant nationalism, xenophobia, and denial of science? Or will we move out toward the stars into the vast majesty of the cosmos filled with the knowledge that life abounds around us and that not all consciousness is biological? How we respond to this trio of cathartic changes will, de will determine the future of our species. For the first time in history, we stand on the verge of ending the threat of a planet-wide disaster forever. Nations, currencies, and long-established social systems and mores will fall to the wayside if our species chooses to continue to the stars. Will we take it? Do we have the vision to lift our eyes up and celebrate the abundance of the universe? Next week, we discuss why space is for everyone. We'll be talking with space developers Martina Spedertovas and Nika Chinchelades of Altair M Enterprises. So make sure to join us then. Please download and share this episode and visit us at thecosmiccompanion.tv or, you know what, just find us pretty much most anywhere online. Clear skies. <laughs>